Hi, I'm Chance. And I'm Sarah Catherine. And this is Conservation Connection. Presented by Last Chance Endeavors. We run a wildlife education nonprofit focused on connecting students to their environment. Each week here on Conservation Connection, we do just that by introducing you to the groundbreaking science and conservation work that's happening every day around the country. We talk to professionals in the world of conservation science and wildlife management and ask them about their career, their current projects, their wild and crazy stories from the field, and everything in between. Join us each week to discover just how these dedicated people are working to protect our planet. Alrighty, everybody, welcome to another episode of Conservation Connection. We are very excited today. We are sitting down with Patrick Thompson, who is the curator of Auburn University's Davis Arboretum. War Eagle, and welcome to the show. War Eagle, and thank you. <laughs> We're so excited you're here. So uh, let's start off with a little bit of what does the job of curator of the Arboretum entail? Curating the collections has a couple different aspects and sometimes they're more divided at different arboretums and botanic gardens but because we're a small staff I wear many hats and so I'm a climbing arborist part of the time I'm a plant recorder database manager photographer tour guide weed puller a little bit of everything yeah yeah a little bit of everything gardening from the soil to the tops of the trees yes sir Speaking of trees and climbing, when we got here right before this episode, we actually saw you just hanging out in a tree, getting a limb down. Literally hanging, like from a rope. <laughs> mm -hmm. So what were you doing and how often do you do that? So that was a removal of a hazard branch. And so we definitely put priority on the safety of our patrons and the students here. But 10 years ago, we applied for accreditation through the Association of the Public Gardens of America. And they came and looked at all our trees and said, you guys need to hire a full-time arborist and do a lot of pruning for structural integrity. And we had managed hazard limbs, but there was a whole lot of work to be done to prolong the lifespan of our trees. So instead of hiring another full-time person, I became the arborist. And so <laughs> that's when I learned to climb and I've been climbing for 10 years now. And it, I think, has improved the collection greatly. Nice. It seems like a nice change of pace from sitting at a desk and crunching numbers. Yes, yes. The access and Excel work that I have to do at the desk is not my favorite. Yeah, <laughs> yep. I get that. When we started a nonprofit, it turned out to be a lot more um, sitting at a computer writing curriculum mm -hmm. than standing in front of people teaching them about nature. But uh, it's all important. Yeah, and so that was another aspect that the Arboretum had to step up its game to get that accreditation for the Oak Collection because we had a records-keeping system, but it was a metal box with 200 note cards in it. Oh, my gosh. Classic. <laughs> Classic. Classic record-keeping. And so now we're tracking 3,500 individual accessions of over 1,000 taxa. Wow. And it's got a lot of good provenance information attached to all those things. So that way, instead of the educational value that we used to have for horticulture and forestry and landscape architecture students to come learn their tree species. Now on top of that, the collections we've added have that providence information that enables us to add conservation value, research value, and really, you know, levels above that we don't even understand yet. Probably. Absolutely, yeah. The kinds of uh, information that once new techniques come out in two or three decades, right. these will be even more valuable then than they are today. Yeah, I think Linnaeus would be happy if the, he knew that the specimens he pressed hundreds of years ago were getting their DNA looked at now. Yeah, still being, <laughs> he didn't even know what that was. Right. So, you know, that's, that's absolutely right. <laughs> now, sharp-eared uh, listeners of the show may hear some bird sounds or some bug sounds. Um, <laughs> this is actually our first episode that we have recorded outdoors, which we're very excited about. Uh, but can you tell us a little bit about the space that we're sitting in? So the Arboretum is a 14-acre collection of plants native to the southeastern U.S. with a focus on Alabama and adjacent states. But really, Alabama is so biodiverse that we've shrunk that mission focus really down to where just getting Alabama's plants represented is still a goal of ours. And when you have plants, then everything in the food web that depends on plants shows up. So, you know, as much as our little island can support we have here and it's really exciting that the bugs come and then the lizards and the birds and the raptors and we have a 
red fox that comes through here often, and I, he's evaded me for years, but I've seen him like three <laughs> times in the last month, so I'm pretty happy. Oh, that's oh. wonderful. <laughs> so uh, how much of your time is split up between working outside and working inside? Like, what's your job look like on your weekly basis? All right, so we're in the post-COVID world here. So my office moved to the house. We have a very small office here on campus, but now pretty much my mornings are spent in the office doing that photography management, database management, and coordinating stuff with other partners for our conservation projects. And so one third of my time is supposed to be as coordinator of the Alabama Plant Conservation Alliance. And coordination is most often emailing, phone calls, writing grants, you know, all of the corralling cats. Work. Corralling cats, yeah. And we have a lot of good cats in Alabama. And so <laughs> I, I do enjoy it. And we learn a lot from our partners across borders in other states. Georgia Plant Conservation Alliance is basically the model we're built on. And you get a lot of good face to face bonding time doing field work that builds the connections that allow the trust for when you call someone in the federal government, you know, can be a little, it was daunting and it can still be a little daunting, but if you've been out in the woods with them a couple of times, built a relationship, built with a relationship them. yeah, then it's a comfortable thing. And so that's my favorite part of the job is making sure everybody that has the same goal is in touch with each other. And that makes a lot of sense because science is, is only part of solving a conservation problem, right? So the first thing we do is we have to get the baseline data and understand it. Then we have to have somebody who manages that data and analyzes it. And then you have to have somebody make decisions and then enforce those decisions so that you end up with a conservation outcome, right? So you have somebody that study where these plants are. And then you have somebody analyze that and say, oh, these are really at risk. And they have to talk to somebody who can make a law or create a preserve or something that changes people's behavior or otherwise really has a solid impact on the plants that you're trying to preserve, right? And that is a lot of steps to get through. So having all of these people, all of these stakeholders together and coordinated is a really, really valuable thing for the ultimate conservation outcome. Absolutely. Absolutely. And one thing that Botanic Gardens and Arboretum are really well positioned for is to employ the conservation horticulture that kind of drops off between the legislation and the scientific need. I mean, there's a, an art and a science to horticulture, and growing these plants and getting them to take hold in the wild isn't something that land managers are trained to do, and it's not something that is going to happen in a university setting very smoothly unless you have people that have been trained specifically to grow these plants, get them in the ground, and then you have to have management on the ground that's very specific and so some of our species are just on the edge of winking out and the spots they live in might only be 10 feet by 10 feet Wow! and the nature conservancy works at a scale of hundreds of acres now they have a wonderful fire program in the state and it's designed at large-scale land management but sometimes you can't wait for the natural cycles especially in, in really highly biodiverse and highly at-risk species the decisions that will make that 100-acre lot work best are not necessarily decisions that are going to save the 15 or 20 individuals found on that 10 by 10 foot stretch. Right, right. And another important aspect of the communication through the Plant Conservation Alliance is, is that maybe that land manager wants to collect some seeds to increase that population, and he's working with, say, partners at the Atlanta Botanical Garden that have been active for a long time in conservation horticulture, but then we also have a university student doing graduate work, testing germination rates. And then we also have fish and wildlife officers giving permissions to other groups to go in and collect seeds for all types of different research. And then nobody knows that there's three or four entities collecting all seeds, seeds in a recommendation from the Center for the Plant Conservation. You're supposed to take 10% of seeds every four or five years. And so people that are trying to do good can be putting unknown pressures on these populations. And so it really takes a lot of communication to make sure we're working together for the best possible good. Yeah. Do you figure out the plants you're going to work with basically just by looking and saying like, okay, these couple of plants have like, there is only one of these plants left. So we need to focus on this because obviously there's 
lots of plants and animals that need our help, but you have to start somewhere. So how do you figure that out? So there's a program called the Alabama Natural Heritage Program through the Alabama Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. And so they have a tracking list of species that they go out and monitor. And we have the botanist from the Alabama Natural Heritage Program, Al Schatz, makes recommendations. And then we can take that and weigh it against the abilities that we have through our partners at any given meeting. We might not know that someone has the ability to do an action until they hear the need in the room. They're like, oh, that's easy. We can, we can fill that need. And in Alabama, we've got about 30 endemic plant species. And right now, the Plant Conservation Alliance is about 20 projects that we're trying to keep an eye on and make sure these things don't fall through the cracks and become extinct. Because we do have a lot of single side endemics and really rare things that are unbelievably rare in the state because they don't occur anywhere else, but also globally rare. Some things that, you know, may be doing fine up in New York, but here in Alabama, we have these last little remnants of populations that we think got pushed down here during the Ice Ages, you know, and they're migrating north and south. But Alabama has had this continuous Goldilocks zone where the Cretaceous Sea didn't flood us the way it did the central part of the U.S. or Florida, and the glaciers didn't make it all the way down. And so we've had, you know, for pretty much as long as plants have been on the planet, there have been plants in Alabama. And that's a really rare situation worldwide. That's crazy. I did not know that. So that that sort of explains why Alabama is as biodiverse as it is, because it has been habitable by plants for so long. Yeah, and it's allowed for extremely fine levels of specialization. And that's how you get single-side endemics like the Bibb County Glades on the Cahaba River, where there's nine species that were described from just a few hundred acres in the 90s. I mean, there's huge that's botanical insane. discoveries going on still in Alabama. That's awesome. <laughs> so when we were setting up this interview, we talked about doing it last week, but you said that you were out um, looking at some monkey face orchids, mm -hmm. I believe, which if you're listening to this episode, you should 100% look that up because they're adorable. They literally look like monkey faces. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. So what were you doing with that project? So I told you that the Georgia Plant Conservation Alliance was basically what we were modeled on. And so 20 years ago... A woman named Jennifer Seska basically threw a whole lot of thinking and looking around and evaluating needs, decided people should talk about plant conservation. And they did that for 10 years, started slow, got the ball rolling, and they said, you know, Alabama, you should do this too. This is working. So 10 years ago, we said, okay, I guess we'll, we'll get together and we'll talk about plants. <laughs> and so we've been doing that for about 10 years. And... A few years ago, there was a meeting called SEPCON that was the first of its kind, and that's Southeastern Partners in Plant Conservation. And so members of the GPCA and the APCA got together with other plant conservation alliances and native plant networks and talked about how a regional approach could be as useful as these state approaches. And so in just the last few years since then, other PCAs have popped up in Mississippi, Tennessee, Florida, North Carolina, South Carolina, and it's kind of radiating out of the South. But we had a second SEPCON meeting, the March right before COVID went crazy. And in the year we've been sitting at the computers coordinating, we have created the SEPCA, which is the Southeastern Plant Conservation Alliance. And even though the monkey face orchid or white fringeless orchid is Platanthera integralabia for those people looking it up and make sure you got the right one. <laughs> and so don't want to confuse the two. Right, right, right. There's a world of confusion out there in orchids. So we don't <laughs> want to feed into that. But even though the monkey face orchid didn't make the Alabama Plant Conservation Alliance's top 25 list, it was chosen through the Southeastern Plant Conservation Alliance as one of their five pilot projects that they really want to sink their teeth into and they offered funding and partners coming over trying to move this monkey face orchid project forward and being the coordinator of the APCA in Alabama I know the people that know the places and was willing to help get them on the ground and see these things so we can make management recommendations and hopefully those recommendations lead to habitat improvement which leads to more flowering which leads to more seed 
which leads to more plants. And this species is listed as threatened under the Federal Endangered Species Act. And so it's not endangered yet. And they didn't go straight for the most endangered species. There's a couple things like Trillium reliculum that ideally could be just delisted based on our surveys, which would, you know, be a victory. Yeah, absolutely. And Anytime you can delist something yeah. from that type of a list is a really good thing. Yeah. And so this monkey face orchid isn't as close to delisting as the relic trillium, but a little bit of management goes a long way. And so hopefully we can keep moving that needle forward, pushing these plants forward through time. Absolutely. Yeah. So when you go out to a site visit like that and you're trying to understand what's going on so you can make better management decisions, what are you looking at? Are you looking at the like physical parameters where it's at? Are you looking at how broadly distributed it is, what are the things that you're looking at and how are those influencing your decisions? Okay, so there's numerous elemental occurrences of the species within the state. And so what we focused on was the occurrences on public lands because management That's where you can there. manage it. Yeah, well, and we can work with private landowners and we do work with private landowners and with some species, that's the only option. Right. But by focusing on the public lands then we know that the management that we put in is going to have a longer-term ability to Sticking stay Sticking power. Yeah, yeah exactly. absolutely. Exactly. So those were the only ones we went and looked at okay. was public land sites. And when we go to those sites, we're using that Natural Heritage Program data set. So we were able to locate, I think we got five out of nine that we saw. Cool. And so those other four, I'll probably call the botanist and be like, all right, Next year when they're in bloom, can we go out together and lay <laughs> eyes on it? But he's a busy man. I mean, there's way too many plants in the state to drag him every time we need to go look at something. I can't imagine. Yeah. So those were, you're talking about nine individual plants. No, nine locations. N okay, nine locations. Nine locations. And so some of those are ones that had been known for years with no management. Some of them are newly documented. One of them was just found for the first time a couple weeks ago. Wow. And... Then the other end of the spectrum is one that's been known about for decades. There was no management, but there was a natural fire regime. Or, well, there was an unnatural fire regime. But <laughs> anyway, they were getting fired. They were there. The fire went away. They disappeared. And since then, we've been managing it for five years and have seen a steady increase in flowering stems from dozens to 343 in the survey we did last week. So talk to me a little bit about the importance of fire for these plants and why that is an issue for them today. So one thing about Alabama's diversity is that it all evolved with a long history of disturbances. And so think about the energy coming up from the Gulf through the Gulf Stream air, keeps us nice and warm and moist, also brings hurricanes, which knock down trees, which make holes in the canopy, a lot of lightning strikes, give fire that keeps the canopy open. But when you take away Smokey the Bear, or when you bring in Smokey the Bear, sorry, and you Who stop Who says that fires, only you can prevent fires. Right, right. And he is very effective. Stopped <laughs> fire, allowed the canopies to fill in, and really changed what the land had looked like for thousands of years. And so in Alabama, we are great at growing trees, almost too good. <laughs> and so, you know, one of the statements at one of these sites was there is a disturbing lack of disturbance is what we had. <laughs> and so it grows in. And at some of these sites, we have four species in the same genus, four types of Platanthera there, which most of the year just have these strap like leaves that are very similar. And in this little two week window, they put up a flower stalk and they're very easy to differentiate. But the rest of the time, it's like, I don't know what species you are. Yeah, it's like trying to find a needle in a needle stack. Because <laughs> <laughs> they're all the Impossible, same. Impossible, yeah. Too similar for most people to tell apart. Absolutely. So because we stopped having fires, we drastically reduced the amount of disturbance that was happening, right? Mm -hmm. So instead of having trees knocked down frequently or having the underbrush burnt out, which anything that is not an established tree is going to burn out, the foliage is going to burn out when the wildfire passes through, what that does is it drops nutrients back into the soil, it opens up sunlight opportunities, and it basically provides a fresh start for the set of species that is found there to refresh itself. So you have species that are only really good at growing and establishing in that first couple of years after a wildfire burns through or after a tree falls down because it's taking advantage of these resources that are not otherwise available in an established community, right? Right. And so the main resource that I find lacking is sunlight. 
Okay. And so the major thing that I'm doing on these sites, which is counterintuitive to some people. You guys be the disturbance? I am. I'm chainsaws (laughs) and fire. And that's what they need. That's awesome. Yeah. So your job is to be chainsaws and fire for the planet. For the rarest plants on Earth. That's pretty cool. That is an that is a job description that should get you high fives anywhere. I think so. I feel like that's the title of this episode. Uh, easily. That was the first thing I thought when you said chainsaws and fire. Yep. Well, and when you only have an area that's, you know, a few hundred square feet maybe that these things are occurring, you can't just drop trees on them. And right. so it requires, you know. Some real smarts about it. Real smarts and really careful zip lining line, like tying trees two other trees and making them fly out of the bog instead of falling on it. So you're zip lining trees out of the bog. Limbs out of the tree, using, using this main stem as an anchor and flying things out to get a quick load of sunlight. Right. Fire is slower. Girdling trees is slower. But some things are really on the brink of extinction. And you need that sunlight now or you're not going to get flowers next year. Right. And so part of the science in this restoration ecology is evaluating the speed of these different methods. And so that is a fascinating story that you would be destructive in order to return this ecosystem back to the balance that it needs desperately to maintain its biodiversity. Yeah. And it's a great career path. I encourage everyone. (laughs) You should see his smile right now because he loves (laughs) what he does. Man, I love it. And I could use some help. And that's only that's only a third of what you do, right? Yes, but there's a lot of overlap. Okay, <laughs> okay. so there are collections here in the arboretum, like the oaks, that have Alabama endemic species. The Alabama sandstone oak, Quaker's born Tony Eye, grows on these sandstone outcrops that are pretty good at keeping the other trees off because of the sh- shallow soil out there on the rocks discourages large trees from growing. But privet is smart enough to get in there and grow up. And so we do still have to help with some management and do some surveys. And that's an invasive, right? That's a Chinese Chinese privet? Yes. Yeah. 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 So that's something that was brought here as an ornamental. Mm-hmm. And now because its berries are delicious to birds, mm-hmm. we then disperse the seeds everywhere. Right. It becomes a dominant foliage in an ecosystem. Right. And so there's two basic types of conservation work that I participate in. In situ conservation work is where I go to the bog and, you know, manage the habitat. In situ, in situation. That's right. In the place where it happens. And then this garden that we're sitting now is a great educational and aesthetic benefit to the university and the people here. But we're also doing serious ex situ conservation where we are collecting things from the wild, dispersing them to other gardens, and making sure that these things have backups in various places just like around. backing up your hard drive just like that except it might die still right yes right. very much so and so there's things that you can seed bank and so we do seed bank lots of rare species but things that don't have orthodox seeds they're seed bankable are called recalcitrant species so a recalcitrant seed cannot be stored and so think about oaks having a big fleshy acorn right and there's so much moisture in that seed when you try to freeze it the ice crystals actually destroy all the embryo yeah Yeah, and it you know that's no way done so the only way to maintain those in safeguarding is through living collections wow and so another aspect of that is that if it's in a garden and all the people die from a virus not that that would ever happen (laughs) but if that did happen you no longer have a managed Right. They're all stuck there. So right. you have to have both. Right. And that so, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. We want them alive on the ground, evolving with the current conditions. But we also have to get that gene pool big enough that they can react to different environmental conditions. Absolutely. So we're sitting here in this beautiful garden, 14 acres, you mm-hmm. said? I, I mean, just looking at the biodiversity, I can see just a massive different, not even types of plants, but like groups of plants here, trees all the way through to, are these carnivorous plants that I see right here? It is. Okay. So those are fascinating. I have to expect that these plants are not all from the same ecosystem or environmental conditions. Is it difficult to keep plants from various places all alive in one area? What kinds of strategies do you have to do to make sure that everybody has the types of soil and water conditions, et cetera, that they need here? Well, that's that 
emerging field of conservation horticulture. I mean, you just, you have to really know your plant and know what it wants. And there are things that I don't try to grow very many times. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll try once or twice or three, but it might be more suited to send it to Chicago. And if we can't grow it here, we'll try Tennessee, but we have partners all over, you know, ingredients of climactic change. You have to have partners everywhere. Absolutely. But we are in a beautiful little Goldilocks zone right here in the Arboretum. And if you look to the south, you're looking out across the coastal plain of Alabama. But if you were to turn around and look north, right from where we're sitting, you'd be looking at the Piedmont. And so we were like on the fall line, separating two eco regions right here in this part of the state. And so we can get away with a pretty good bit here. That's a, that's a good place where you've got some wiggle room to get something that's really coastally adapted, but also something that's almost all the way up into the mountains. Right. You know, you've got a... You've got some flexibility here. It's not going to be as hot and humid, which would kill your more mountainous plants. And it's not going to be as cold in the winter, which is going to kill your coastal plants. That is like the definition of a Goldilocks zone. Mm -hmm. So I have to ask, do you have a favorite plant? Oh, (laughs) a white oak is just about as majestic as it gets for a single individual specimen. But I mean, I've been knocked over by many different plants at many different times. And, you know, it's the one that's doing its thing right then. I like that. I mean, sometimes the azaleas are just making my eyes pop out. Sometimes the pitcher plants blow my mind. Things that I didn't think were possible when you look out across it in the wild. I mean, it's just awe-inspiring. And that's the kind of passion that really drive somebody to help protect the planet and be the chainsaws and fires that the planet needs in order to conserve these incredible species. So just to kind of wrap up here today, if someone listening wanted to get into this field, what would you recommend kind of the path that they would take to get to be doing what you're doing? So there is a wide variety of people that come together to make this happen. And I don't think there's a wrong path. I mean, learning is key. Learning through books is important, but experiential learning is huge. And there's a lot of people that want to share this information. And so I think garden clubs are a great way to go. Just getting out there. Yeah, I mean, I'm all for protecting plants that aren't that rare. I'm trying to get, one of my pushes lately has been for people just to grow native azaleas and keep good records. You know, they're not endangered yet, but that's when you want to Have get a strong out baseline. ahead of it. Yeah. You don't want any species to go through a genetic bottleneck. You want to conserve as many things as possible. Absolutely. And so I think that the native gardening movement is going to be one of the biggest things that people can get their hands on and get to know how to work with plant species in their own space that will eventually build to more and more species coming into cultivation. And that will eventually, hopefully, start to mirror the biodiversity that naturally occurs in the state. Absolutely. I love that. One last question before we sign off. Are there ways to volunteer with some of these plant protection alliances? And if a listener wanted to volunteer or do something, where would they look to find that information? Public gardens are very well positioned for that too. Most of them have volunteer programs. A lot of them now are working with rare plant conservation. And so going to, you know, in the Southeast, the Atlanta Botanical Gardens is really a hub, but here in Alabama, Dothan Botanical Gardens is getting their toes in it. Birmingham Botanical Gardens has been at it for a while. Here at the Arboretum is a big deal. But at the Huntsville Botanic Gardens, they have just created a department of conservation which is huge. There's no other garden in the state of Alabama that has a department of conservation. So kudos to Huntsville Botanic Gardens for going next level here. That's awesome. I love it. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. We've had an absolute blast sitting here listening to these awesome animals that are all here because of the plants that you cultivate. So thank you so much for being here. Thank y'all for coming. Appreciate what you do. Thanks for listening to this episode of Conservation Connection. If you enjoyed our podcast, go ahead and subscribe to make sure you catch every episode that we post. 
We'd love to hear from you. So if you want to reach out, go to our website, lastchanceendeavors.com backslash contact and shoot us an email. We love questions from our listeners. So if you heard something that you want to know more about, be sure to let us know. If you've got a minute to spare, leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts will help other conservation-minded people find the show. We'd really appreciate it. A big thanks to the people working to protect our planet, and a big thanks to you for listening. Don't forget to tune in next week.